right. I like, I'm not going to lie. I like doing the once a week now also, by the way, <laughs> just yeah. because I feel like yeah. we actually have, uh, we have more to talk about every single week and then it makes it a lot easier to podcast as weird as that sounds. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's hard when you try to think of five or six topics twice a week. There's not, there's not that much going on in snap. To, I mean, there's to enough, that you know, much we could, stuff. we could BS it the whole way, but yeah, there's something. Yeah. We could, we could spend 30 minutes talking about one card. Like we're probably going <laughs> to do that today. Let's that. be honest here. <laughs> um, if you're good, good, sir, I am. I'm good, man. All right, let's do this. Let's welcome in all the peoples officially, intro music and all, and say welcome. Welcome on into the Snapback Podcast, where you snap and we snap back. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming, and as always here, joined with Default Dan. Good morning, yep. good sir. Morning, man. Morning, man. It's uh, It's been an interesting week. It's been a busy week, but excited to be here talking about Snap. Yeah, as as always, there's. It's been an exciting week, <laughs> it, yeah. for me, uh, to say the least. Yeah, it's yeah. been an absolutely exciting week, and it's nice to kind of decompress. You know, now with a semi keyword semi regular routine of recording yeah. with you again, and I'm like, you know what, we 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 got stuff to talk about, and we'll just gonna let's yeah. just roll into it. We don't need to give the preview yeah, of fully everything <laughs> unless people want to know. You know, if they well, want to know, they'll read. You know, you're curious because yeah, yeah. I, I know yeah, you have I'm no curi- idea what the hell is going on. But uh, well, I'm curious. I'm curious about your uh, past weekend because, mm-hmm. uh, like you mentioned, we, we've done a lot of stuff together, including a lot of tournaments. And I tend to be the one on the backside running all these tournaments. But you had your first tournament, yeah, the, uh, the Agatha Open that you had to run it all. Like I don't know, you may have had some help from CCG and, and some of those guys, but like, how did it go? What were your thoughts and was it did you actually get to experience how hard it is from from my side in the background doing everything I mean, and keeping it all up yeah i mean we've worked on tournaments together so i've been on the the moderation <laughs> side of yeah, yeah. the tournament side i've been on the production side of large events and the tournament side and i mean first off shiva gets a huge shout out because he did the full production live okay. while i was on screen nonstop <laughs> the entire time in full commentation mode and while simultaneously yeah, yeah. also being in the chats you know as as i do you know i'm always wearing nine yeah, hats yeah. at once whenever i stream yet alone whenever i host an event or do an event so i've also got like on my screen here i've got like two different discord windows open simultaneously so i'm reading the chat that's yeah. going on with the cc uh, sorry with the rally cry team i'm reading the chat going on with shiva to keep me posted who i also have in my ear at the same time and then there's the live chat going on and then there's the gameplay going on and then it's just yeah, like yeah. you know you're you're always making a billion different things happen at once um first and foremost we almost had a small riot after round one because <sighs> we had to like the way we were rolling out the event was nonstop, you know, get games going, get pairings going, get things going, right? Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden the system backfired on Rally Cry. And the first version of the fix was, well, they had to switch it then to Swiss instead of round robin mm-hmm. style, syst- systematically. And yeah, yeah. which that would have meant everybody has to do a round and then everybody waits for everybody to finish and then everybody gets paired yeah, yeah. up. And that's not what the goal of the event was. So right, right. while I'm live, I'm also dealing with that going, we have to fix this. This isn't what this <laughs> event is. It's rapid fire. It's how it's been advertised, yeah. et cetera. And they figured it out. But it was probably yeah. the in that first hour, the most stressful thing to deal with was trying to figure out how are they going to do it. And I think yeah. it was a combination of switching it out of Swiss back into round robin manual followed by updating yeah. it once they had the system actually going simultaneously it was just like yeah, yeah. they did a great well, job in recovery mode but when it did break it did break <laughs> and at the speaking of breaking yeah. we crashed ccg hub because we had so many people using the be- deck builder at one time that the site crashed yeah, yeah. which we were not expecting <laughs> and prepared for so obviously yeah. you know shiv went went into the site built it back up, got it up and running. So it was down for like 10 minutes, but 10 minutes during a one hour registration period to submit your deck list. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and it was, a, and, it was yeah. fun. It was fun in those moments, but that's, yeah, that's what happens. Yeah. I was wondering when you told me the way your format was, because it, it's in a unique format. So the fact that like 
I we've only seen this one other time, and this was one of the big first ones over in the EU, one of the big tournaments that was in person. So the difference was it was in person. You literally just walked up to somebody who was like, oh, you two go battle. Like there wasn't a system, right? It was just yeah. like, once you're done battling, come tell me, I'm going to write it down on this piece of paper. Yeah. So this is the first time of somebody trying to do this virtually. Um, and when you told me about it, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm I'm interested. I'm interested to see how Rally Cry is going to do that because there isn't a system that's specifically built to just be like, hey, rapid fire. It's not a bracket. It's not anything that's uh, logically um, yeah. done, right? And when I say that, I mean like from computer from computer speak and knowledge and everything, there's not just where you just go, okay, you could play nine rounds, but you could play four, right? Or you could play 20 because you like literally just go all in, snap, oh, I lost, I'm out, go right. get the next one because there wasn't, penalties i guess for losses it was just how many losses, wins do you have yeah. outside of breakers right exactly so. yeah, that's what i was gonna say losses were the were the breaker points but mm -hmm. even with that tactic those who did that tactic didn't do well those who actually yep. played it out strategically even with agatha playouts those who played it yep. out strategically ended up in the top eight and ended up cashing out yeah so yeah. that was and that was probably the biggest surprise to me where a lot of people were, they were commenting on it. Like, oh, it's an RNG yep. tournament or, oh, this is just proving ground style tournaments. Like, no, I yep. promise you that's not what's going to happen. And because of that, those who didn't do that yep. ended up with the well, top 10, top eight, top 16, top whatever it ended up being yeah. for them to place on out. Yeah, and, and I'll say there will be an article on CCG Hub coming out later where we break down the tournament. We talk about it because... You know, without getting into too many details and things like that, the people I know the person who won it, right? Looking over their deck, there was a uh, mm -hmm. a group of guys or a group of people that that got together and really thought out how to interact with this Agatha deck. Yeah, not your typical turn three, try to discard her, whatever. You know, bring her back with Ghost Rider. Like right. it wasn't the typical Agatha deck that we thought um, that we think of and most people play. It truly was methodically thought about, and the the deck that topped the tournament, I read over, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, I, I would have never thought about this, but then when you read it, you're like, "This is so like, it makes the most yeah. sense out of anything." So, uh, yeah. So there will be an article over on CCG Hub uh, talking about the tournament, breaking it down. So keep your eyes out uh, for that. Uh, but yeah, I was I was excited for you, man. You, you had a successful yeah. tournament. Everybody loved it. Uh, it was different than all these other tournaments that are yeah. out there. Uh, you know, play the best deck in the meta. Uh, so I and enjoyed I, it. I gotta, you know, and you know, without being that guy, all the quick shout outs, CCG Hub, Advanced.gg, Rally Cry, Snap Kang. The sponsors that came in for the tournament are the only ones that actually yeah. made it actually happen. That's part one. Part yeah. two, Shiva for producing the tournament specifically while we were live. A lot of help to say the absolute yeah. minimum. All of the Twitch mods like Bude and Lori and everybody who were able to come on in and help on the back end to help that yeah. experience be nice and smooth, they all get just as much credit. All of the Rally Cry mods who were handling all of the questions nonstop during, like it was it was a team effort to make yeah. it happen. I just happened to look pretty. And then, oh, also, and simultaneously, <laughs> I also get to put the shout, out, shout outs to uh, Teebs who came on in during the event with mm -hmm. a huge raid to kick it off. And then all of the advertisement that happened from the daytime as well, from the double raid from Lammy and Alex Kocha. Like yeah. I, I went in that morning, like I'm just going to have a fun morning raid, a uh, fun, fun, fun morning stream. And then got raided by Alex with like four grand. And then yeah. Ali raided, uh, I'm sorry, Lammy raided on in a little later on with like another like grand and a half. So it was just like, it was a wild, yeah. wild day. <laughs> Yeah, of yeah. just chaos yeah. so I, I'm thank you for asking but it was it was a really successful event I think we're gonna do another theme event come mm. the future um but there's more tournament announcements coming relatively soon so just stick with it nice. um that's all I'm going to say for now because I think it's fair that we move past and yeah. look to the new era and the new future that is no. Marvel Snap in my opinion um, and that has to deal with the new world that we are living in with Nico Minoru, because I <laughs> yeah. truly feel like she is just a completely different level of 
card that now exists in this game. And yeah. we knew she was going to be good. And I broke this down in detail in the Numbers Never Lie article of I knew she's going to be good. And here's the proof. Here's how yeah. I thought about it. And then all of this kind of transpired. And then all of this started to happen. And now take a look at it. Hate to say it, but I told you so. And it's amazing that people are like, oh my God, such an exciting card. Oh my God, so cool. So much fun. Da -da -da. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. It literally plots into everywhere. I absolutely love Nico Minoru. I think she's going to be relevant for a very long time in this game because of how her yeah. spells interact. Yet, I do not think she is a broken character. I think she yeah. is a very well-created mechanic that has mm -hmm. enough RNG mixed in with enough strength that you will always consider it as a tech option because of how cheap it is. Yeah, and I'm like, so I've used her, I've used her a little bit, right? So I haven't played as much snap this week as I would have hoped I would have been able to, but I have been playing with her a lot. I've been playing with her with, you know, the destroy decks, the, the Phoenix decks, the move decks, just random stuff in there. I've really enjoyed the card. I'm, it's hard to tell right now. I'm a little concerned that she's not busted, but I am a little concerned that right now her play rate is very high, but she's brand new. So it's hard to yeah. tell. I mean, if you think about it, like a right? Like a I haven't seen an a in over a week. Um, <laughs> And, and again, I mean, nice? <laughs> he's, God. he's still around. He's still around, but people are playing with new stuff right now. So like, it'll take us a few weeks to figure out, is she being overplayed? Because I am a little worried right now that she's being overplayed. So if she gets touched, it's not because she's broken. It's not because she needs anything, but there's a potential that we've seen from the devs that if a card gets played too much, then they will get tweaked. And, and again, it's too early to say anything, but I would agree with you on the fact that I don't think she's busted. I think she's a great card that can fit into so many decks and give you different things. So giving you the randomness of moving a card, right? Like playing yeah. that, that kind of like get around something like a location that you can't get into. Um, unlike iron fist, she goes the other way, right? Having her being able to double herself to where you could like bounce her back and then potentially double herself again. Like there's, there's a lot of cool, interesting interactions with her that I've enjoyed seeing her out there. Um, and again, I, I would say right now, the only the only quote unquote annoyance that I've seen is I've just seen the especially like the Phoenix deck, right? It's like everywhere right now. And yeah, well, um, <laughs> we'll we'll have to see what happens, right? There's like, over no the next reason for it to be all so. the way around anywhere and everywhere. There's <laughs> absolutely that's it's, literally how I open the article. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a consistent deck. It is not well, a competitively consistent deck. The numbers do not lie. It's the name of the fucking article, all right? No, but here, it's here's the how thing. I opened it. The necessary intro. Phoenix forces fetch. Stop trying to make fetch happen. The numbers have shown that, yes, you split the difference, and when you get it to happen, it's great, but it's not consistent enough to make happen, no matter well, what other because, variations you make. That's because, so... I kind of agree and I kind of don't, right? Like you're, you're close. The deck you have up is so close to the deck that I sent you minus Nico. The one I sent you was prior to Nico. Get rid of Human Torch. Nobody nobody likes him. He's not good. But And and even Zola doesn't need to be in there. But there are decks to where I feel like it works really well. But yes, I agree. Right now, a lot of people are running this deck. It's a variation of this deck. And I think that if you build it right, she's just an added bonus into the deck because the deck is already good. Um, at least the version I've been playing and I've been going with, which does have most of these cards. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I think that we'll find what's going to be her best deck. And I agree with you that she's more of a, almost like, I don't, I know so many, so many people say Thanos. She's not Thanos. Thanos and the stones are different, but in concept, she's similar. And the fact yeah. that the stones give you the ability to do different things than a normal deck would give you, she gives you the ability to do different things that a normal card wouldn't allow you to do. And it's different every time. But I agree with you. You're not always going to draw her, so you can't rely on her. She has right. to just be one of those tech cards that if you get her, it's great. And if not, your deck still works without her. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I've been excited about her. I think the fact that she's cheap, the fact that she's in the the 
early one drop, whatever, like like she can play into a lot of decks. I think if they would have made her a two or a three, she'd have been a little bit harder to figure out. Can she take a slot in your deck? Yeah, um, agreed. So I, I, I like it. I, I like the card. It's, I like the mechanic and it's different. Yeah, because the mechanic is built specifically with the idea that it has to have another card synergy. It has mm -hmm. to be a low cost card. It has to be something that you could ideally play her plus a three drop on turn four or yep. leading her in at the end of turn four into a five drop on five. Like it's built with that in yep. mind. So there's no way she could have been a two cost card in my opinion, right. especially if you're right. having seven spells just in case. So you're looking to, you need her to be a cheap card. So yep. knowing how those different mechanics work and how the randomness of them appears, like a lot of people were saying, Oh, she has the reality stone built in, but reality stone is technically a one one yes you have your stones that are at cheaper costs but also you're paying yeah. for randomness so that's why you justify the power at one two i think the yeah. biggest one the biggest thing about her that surprised me was the amount of times i was enjoying her double up ability the ability to play after you play your next card double this card's power and mm -hmm. getting her to one eight was very consistent because there were several times i'm sitting there going i need something cheap so i would forge into nico minoru followed by whatever else at any given point and now she's a one eight like yeah. that stat line alone is worth remembering and people are even treating her like zola yeah i sorry yeah. like black panther and zola ing her because then it reprocs yeah. her ability and now she's a 16 power in two different lanes like there's there's a lot of cool things you can do with that that yep. give your last little cherry on top of of power that you don't want to neglect necessarily. So I was very surprised with that. And the one that I think also surprised me a little bit, keyword, was the amount of times I wanted to use the move mechanic on her. Because I thought yep. it was just going to be like, okay, it's a ghost spider thing, right? Every now and then you want to move over to the right hand side. But the amount of times I ended up wanting to do that, whether it be because... I was getting the Elsa Bloodstone bonus and then moving off or was playing yeah. on top of Angela and then moving off. I kept finding more use cases for it as I went through different bounce decks. I went through Thanos decks. I was going through destroy decks, even with the Phoenix mm -hmm. Force testing. Like every time I tried something, I was pleasantly yeah. surprised. So that's the thing with Nico is that, and I, I kind of mentioned this a bit, I don't think we found Nico's best deck yet. A lot of people are saying destroy and destroy in my opinion is probably her best home right now. I yep. think she will have another deck come to be that all yep. of a sudden people are just like this tech card is busted in this. And I yep. don't know what that looks like yet, but I do think that there is something else coming. It could be like I'm many of us are saying it's bounce Darkhawk Bounce is just broken. The one I put up on YouTube has already been doing mm -hmm. very well. And multiple creators have done the exact same deck at this point now. Jeff Hoagland did the exact same video. Lammy has also put on, I think, a, a bounce variation. I think I don't know if yeah. it's the same one or slightly different. I know Educated Collins put up a, a bounce video. Like there, there's so many different creators that are saying, oh, she's great in bounce. Yes, yeah. she's really fucking good at bounce. Like she's just yeah, a yeah. She's a card that I, and, and this is the thing that I want to make very clear. She's not nerf worthy dangerous though, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. She's not I, hazardous that way. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think in any way of her, of her mechanics, of her stats or anything like that. Like, I don't think that there's anything in there that says like, oh, this card is going to be super broken that somebody's going to find some crazy stuff. Yes. I think we're going to find a deck because because the problem you run into or with that I've found the most, right, is when you're playing like the Phoenix deck. Yeah. Specifically, I'm going to talk about that one because I played it the most right now, uh, or at least my variation on it. Like her, when you're saying like there's there's different lines where she doesn't really work. And and I found those where you want to forge into multiple man into killing it. Right. The problem is she wants to be played right before that card. She wants to be played right before multiple man to kill multiple man, which means now you don't forge into multiple man. Uh, the move mechanic is pretty good, but again, with your multiple man line specifically, you're stopping your forge. 
when you think of yeah. like the destroy of your Nimrod, you're putting her before your Shuri. So you lose your Shuri Nimrod. So there is a lot of like non bows with her um, in that. But again, there's also upsides where you do have your line of destroy. So you do forge multiple man carnage to kill your multiple man, her to do a move. And then your next card, you play Phoenix. So you get the yeah. free move, right? Like, there are some similar, and it'd be the same thing as putting like Iron Fist in that spot, which is also not in the deck usually. But, um, but there's there's some cool things in there. I just my would I would say the only thing I would I could see, eventually, is if we do find that she's just so good to put in every deck, like we had with, I don't want to say Luke Cage because I feel like he was just always an answer card, but like yeah, Mobius. Loki, like all these cards that are just so good, you put them in all these different decks. I feel like that's the only way she's going to get touched is just they go, oh, she's in 75% of all decks. We have to bump her up to a two just because, yeah. you know, but yeah. I don't I don't see that happening. But I'm just saying, like, that's the only way I could see her getting touched. But at this point, I don't think she goes in 75% of decks. I just I think she'll end up being like a forty percent or card or a thirty five percent or card. Yeah. Um. Once we find like all those nuanced interactions that we like with her. Yeah, and 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 this is the other thing too is that until we fully understand her, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like Captain Marvel in that aspect where if you understand all of the interactions and how they work, then it's a yeah. really powerful card. And it's just very infantile right now. Like I was testing out like, okay, the destroy and draw two cards. I read it as, you know, destroy and draw two. So two separate unique actions, but it is an and then situation yeah. where if you play the card into armor or sorry, I had played it into Wakandan Express and tried to get it to happen. It didn't destroy the card. It did not draw two cards. Luke, right. uh, Luke's bar interactions as well as Falcon. When you bounce Nico, the self abilities don't inflict but the other card abilities do inflict. So you can't mm -hmm. give herself the 2X if she's been bounced into your hand. But if you do play her down and then you do some other bounce mechanic that then would affect moving Falcon to the right, that does go through. So it's, it's yeah. these little interactions that people are still going to be learning. And honestly, I think the competitive players are really heavily focusing on right now because yeah. of her flexibility. The idea yeah. of sacrificing cards to draw more cards is nuts. And yeah. the ability to move without needing to have a move card built in there. The ability to yeah. change deep space, which I did, which was fantastic mm -hmm. to be able to move around. That was a right, huge, right. big deal. You know, these are these little pieces that you can work with now that I love. And I think she's going to be an incredibly relevant card for a long time. And I think people need to take advantage of the fact that she's accessible at the moment. I think she's the yeah. first card in a long time, I would say. Whether it takes 6,000 tokens and you push for it right now, or you figure out how to grind and get to that fourth spot like cash because you're mm -hmm. just that close and you have bad luck, she's worth it. Yeah. Absolutely and I think, worth it. I think she's actually... Coming back in spotlights pretty soon. December, she comes back again. Uh, yeah, so yeah. so You'll I have would another agree with chance, you. I think, but like, yeah, I would just say if you if you can't, like, if you know you're super free to play, you don't have the spotlights, you don't have the tokens. Yeah, be aware that she is coming back in the spotlight in the future because I agree with you. I think she's one of those cards that is not deck specific. Yeah, and I think that that's the important piece. There's yeah, there's a lot of cards that come through here that look really cool, but they're very deck specific. Um, and there's only a few, which we've gotten quite a few yeah. over the last month or so with like Mobius and stuff like that. But, um, but definitely she's, well, a, she's a card. I would, I would be okay with the investment. Right? Here's, and, and here's my, my counter slash justification on certain things. So there are good tech cards and then there are universal tech cards, right? You have yeah. an armor, which goes into a lot of decks, but the reason it goes into a lot of decks is because you are synergizing it with high power cards that you don't want shang chi for example, right? right? You have Luke Cage, which is an incredibly powerful tech card, so you can't reduce your own. And for the most part, that's also done to prevent from being Shadow Kinged and a little bit of extra synergy if you happen to pull up like 
sewer system or one of the awful locations yeah, yeah. that'll reduce you, right? So there's that little bit of techiness to it. But then there's cards like Jeff the Baby Landshark, where we yeah. all praise Jeff the Baby Landshark heavily as absolutely worth your 6,000 tokens, get Jeff, whatever you, because he's a plug and play card into yeah. any and all decks at any given point. That's how I feel about Nico Minoru as well. She's just as flexible. You can literally put her into any deck and it would work 100%. Yeah. I'd agree. I'd agree. Right? There's a lot of, lot of nuance in what she can do in the deck to pump it up. So I would agree with that. But, you know, speaking of some of those cards, right? Mm -hmm. we, we've got a lot of them out there. Uh, we had a lot of them get touched in this OTA. Uh, some of them I wasn't expecting to see get touched. But yeah. a few others... Uh, we we predicted, and one of the ones I know I predicted that we've talked about a lot was Elsa saying, hey, plus three, hey, it's too strong. It needs yeah. to be plus two. Um, and that's what they did. They didn't really touch anything else outside of the fact that she's just going to get plus two instead of the plus three. What are your thoughts around that? Have you used her since, since the change? Yeah. I used her yesterday. I put in the exact same Darkhawk bounce deck that I did yep. prior to the OTA and got an infinite ticket, clean sweep, first shot, taking down three destroy decks in a row. Classic destroy, yep. Phoenix Force, and new Nico Deadpool destroy. Yep. With the Bloodstone bounce mixed in with Nico. Yeah. It's there. The change was needed, and we all knew the change was coming. I think yep. the shock for most people is that it happened in her season. And yep. it even came up in my Twitch chat. Yeah, it was, in, I forget it was YouTube or Twitch side, but like in the Twitch chat that, you know, has this ever happened before? I'm like, yes, they changed Phoenix Force mid-season, but that was a buff. They made yep. her, you know, cheaper because she was a five, what, when she came out? A five know, something. It's it it a five drop to where you only got one move. It, it felt yeah. really bad unless she was you a five had piece to have of magic. Shit. You know, Phoenix yeah. Force was a five piece of shit. And then was moved to a four was like, hey, now we can work with something here. We got something going. Yeah. You know, there was there was reasons to be excited. And this is the first time we've seen a season pass get nerfed in yeah. the season of the season pass still currently existing. And to be completely honest, I'm OK with it because it was yeah. that strong. Elsa was to the strength point that her play rate and win rate was exceeding not just normal thresholds, but the justification mm -hmm. for players, like how I just talked about Jeff and Nico, you could yeah. talk about Elsa Bloodstone and put her into any deck because yeah. she automatically justifies herself after one lane being filled because now you're getting the equivalent of five power for two cost yeah. Yeah, yeah. in total. And, and that's not okay. Yeah, and typically in any kind of Marvel Snap game, you're going to fill out two, two lanes, like realistically, not even having the whole to like... Yeah. If right. you built it that even, deck that way, yeah. Yeah. So, like, I mean, you could you could realistically fill all three lanes in some games, but I'm just saying most games you can yeah. fill two. So, real, you know, that ends up being a 2-8. Way too good. Yeah. And this is not even talking about, like, how she was being used oh, with yeah. Angela, you know, throwing in, you know, because we were seeing yeah, Nightcrawler Mysterio, coming back. Nightcrawler, like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had everything, right? So, like... We had so many cards that were getting that buff and then moved yeah. out and then another card getting the buff um, and yeah. things like that. So, yeah, I think the plus two, um, you know, the thing is, every I, I saw a lot of people like, oh, complaining about that, right? Like, oh, it's, she's a brand new card. It's like, here's the thing. It's going to happen again. Um, when it comes to any of these card games or, or whatever, they always try to push the bounds. And if and be honest, if we think back at Zabu, everybody was complaining to where they should have changed him during the season we think of surfer surfer should have been changed during the season and they yep. waited they waited and then they just got the flack of oh you waited to do it after everybody spent their money and then did it and they were you know because it was after the season now yep. it's in the season people are still gonna have the same argument but like I, I, the thing is, she's still good plus two the is still making a difference on most of the decks and all of the decks that she was like huge in yeah you weren't winning by one one point Right. You were winning by a lot of points. All of the points. Um, yeah. It's also great and just, you know, fun, you know, appropriate jab. I love how they do the nerf and then 
the next, mm-hmm. like, I forget if it was a few hours later or this morning, get the message of win a bloodstone battle pass, follow us here on Twitch and submit your deck list and da-da-da, or whatever it was like yeah, yeah. on Twitter or discord or wherever they put it. I was like, yeah, yeah. Oh, now you're doing the giveaway again, but only for you. Where's the rest for the creators again? I know. Mm-hmm. I know. You know, we, we, I, we want, that I knew, back. I knew that was going to happen too, but at the same yeah. time, like I hope they get back to giving us some giveaways. Give oh, us, God, you know, it can that. be credits, credits, gold, yeah. whatever things that don't matter. It's digital. Like, yeah, give us some stuff. Um, give us free stuff. <laughs> We're a community but, too. All right, but move it on. Move it on. Since speaking since, of another yeah. season pass card, Loki. Yes. Thoughts? Thoughts on this? So Needed. thought about why they went from a three five to a four five. Trying to figure out exactly what the issue was. Because they even reflected, and I'm gonna tie this with also talking about Collector, who was also yeah. changed back from two oh to two two, right? I think the co- coercion between making Loki a 4-5 and bringing Collector back to 2-2, they must have seen that the most successful win combination for Loki was playing Loki plus Collector on turn 5. I think that's what they are specifically targeting with the nerf being like this because many Loki players aren't playing Loki on 3. Let's be honest here. But even well, when you have the line, even when you had the line of going Quinjet, Collector, Loki, did you? No. You put out Colson, you put out Mirage, you put out all these, you know, Snow Guard, you did all these other things. And then on turn four or five, you then decide to play your Loki. So now what you're trying to remove also is the other Loki combinations. You're trying to reduce the specific combinations of your two cost pullers right you're trying to do your colson by itself but colson and not maria hill in her old version you have maria hill in the new version which is only a two cost card so now you're looking at the further synergy of cable you know you're increasing the cost on cable you're messing with the card draws in different other mechanics like mantis right that's what they're trying this is a full package collection when you look at it when you say okay we increased these cards because the amount of mill plus the amount of switch that you could get from Loki, that combination was too much. So the final piece to this was making Loki a 4-5, which is why they can justify Lo- Collector going back to 2-2, two, two, because you're not typically playing Collector on 2. You're probably playing the other cards because of your chance to actually pull them. You have more card draw cards that are cheaper than you do you have co- chance to get well, Collector. I think I think there was two kind of lines with it when we look at the two different plays. I, there was a lot of gameplay. If you're playing against a Loki deck and you have Snow Guard into any draw card, right? Maria Hill, um, Mirage, any of those. There was a line if you're playing against Loki to play them on three uh, because you have you still have a pretty good hand size in order to maybe hit their Loki, maybe hit their collector if they're playing it where I think it did give them like one extra turn. Now on most games, if you're not playing against Loki, I agree with you. You would tend to play them on four. You'd tend to play them on five to see if you could get some kind of explosive turn six. Right. Um, But the turn three play was a strong play in the Loki mirrors. And so I think that there's some stuff around that. I think you also look at like, like there wasn't surfer, right? It, he didn't go yeah. from three to four to get rid of like a surfer play. But I, I definitely think there was kind of like being able to do him. I think it also stops the like crazy turn six plays that you had. So to your point with the collector, um, not necessarily on five. I mean, yes, the collector plus Loki on five, but you are eating two cards out of your hand. Um, but the thing that people were doing on like turn six, where you had like Loki plus snow guard plus another card all on turn six to buff that collector, right? Like was also a big thing. They don't like, in my personal opinion, whenever we see like crazy, really good turn six stuff where you're playing like multiple cards on turn six, I feel like they've come in to hit those. You've had things like hit monkey go up to mm-hmm. a three instead of a two. Like they really like, I think they know that turn six is so important, which is why they really focus on like, what is the six drop? But I think they also don't want people being like, oh, you're going to play four cards on, <laughs> on turn six. No, mm-hmm. we can't have that. Right. So, like, I do think that they've hit 
um, some cards, and I think Loki is one of those cards that was just a little too strong to play at three because of late plays. So I agree with you on the fact of like that turn five or that turn six of of him being a little too cheap there. Um, but I, I think with Collector kind of going off of that line, like I think he got touched because he fell out of all the other decks. Yeah. Like whenever you're playing Collector, now it's Collector Loki. And we've already seen like if you're not playing a mirror, Collector's not that great. Yeah. Like when he was a zero, he would be like a two four Maybe like a two, like in your perfect world, he's like a two seven or a two eight. And that's like if you had like Snow Guard into a good Loki into whatever. Mm-hmm. But like in most most games, he wasn't, he didn't feel like he was that busted powerful card like he used to be. And so, uh, you know, they brought it back because of the plus one instead of the plus two and things like that. You could see his power really went down, kind of like Kitty Pride. Like I feel like Kitty Pride used to be this amazing whatever card. And now we're in a world where, like, you question if you're putting her in your deck anymore because she only gets yeah. like a one four, right? Like, well, so I'm going to use know. that as a segue <laughs> because yeah. the same adjustment they gave to Kitty Pride, they just gave to Angela. Yeah. And I think that you also have to consider in your bounce decks, you know, we're seeing bounce decks like I run them, for example, bounce yeah, decks yeah. that don't include Kitty Pride. Because you don't now have to have Kitty Pride yeah. in your bounce decks. Yeah, I think because of this, Elsa. Yeah. Right, because of Elsa. I think you can now justify the exact same thing with Angela. She went from a 2 0 to a 2 2, but instead of giving plus two, she now gets plus one. They literally gave her the Kitty Pride treatment. And I think you start right. thinking the same way about Angela of, to me, she's good. But there is a small case to be made that, for example, in those awesome bounce decks, maybe the collector now replaces her. Because to bounce Beast and Falcon, Mm -hmm. to get those cards back in your hand, I think you do more bouncing back into your hand than you do on top of Angela. So it's something I'm going to be testing. And I know it's already being talked about in kind of, you know, low ends in the community too but it's something to keep an eye on because i think that there could be something there to to that because i think this angela adjustment is needed because she's been very strong for a very long time yeah but at the same time it's it's really it's a big hit yeah and and i think the the elsa uh interaction is what i think really did it in for Angela. I think that yeah. Angela's been a great card, right? Like no matter how we played her with throwing night crawlers and Jeffs and things like that, that we we're doing before Elsa was really good to get the plus two. But I think now with the whole, you know, being able to Elsa a kitty pride over and over and over, like yeah. it's huge. There is a slight difference in the current kitty. The current kitty is she starts with zero power. Now we're giving Angela two. So this actually is a good thing because one location that you would always hit would be Shuri's lap, right? And you wanted to throw your Kitty Pride into Shuri's lap. What we've learned now after playing more and more times, which is obvious, but you, you know, the first time you throw her in, she gets no, like you throw in um, Kitty Pride, she gets no buff. Whereas before when she had power, it she, she snowballed. But the thing was, you never wanted to throw Angela in there to also get the Kitty Pride because she was a zero yeah. and it didn't benefit. So, I, there are going to be some cool interactions with her now having power to where you can throw her into Shuri's lab, get the plus two. I know it's not a lot, but two plus two, it matters Yeah, uh, in a lot of games. And now you don't feel as bad because you're also throwing a Kitty Pride or whatever into Shuri's tower or Shuri's lab to get pulled back and, and all of that. So, yeah, I I agree. I think the, I think it needed to go to a plus one. It's a hard one because so many people love Angela. Um, and yeah, maybe this does. hard, right? Series yeah. two? Well, series three. Uh, she may be a series two. I don't know. She's, she's the, the, the trolls will let us know in the YouTube yeah. comments, but like, <laughs> but but again, it it is one of those where she she ended up in a lot of decks because of just extra value. Um, so I, I would agree. I think it's good to kind of see that. So, what about um, the huge change? Huge change to Sauron. <laughs> uh, this is. 
this is one of those things where they just don't know how to deal with Shuri. <laughs> we see this with so many times where it's like, hey, we're going to take away one power from Shuri. That's fine. She's not the card that's getting doubled. All right, we're going to go. We're going to take a little bit from this card. That's fine. It's still a giant card, right? Like I, here's Shuri here's, is just one of those cards. That's yeah, I I think they were on the right path with Shuri with reducing her power. Yeah. But the way that the Shuri deck is, Shuri decks are played, you're not putting cheap cards on top of Shuri. And right. by now reducing Sauron down to 3-2. Let me look dead in the camera on this one. This doesn't fix it yet, okay? Even with them saying that there are new potential tools coming for Sauron in the future. Yeah. That's exciting. Woohoo. The Shuri decks, whether it be Shuri Nimrod, Shuri Red Skull, Sh you know, even when you do Shuri Ebony Maw in that deck, right? You're still putting on a 1-7. Yeah. And yep. that, to me, is where you put your alarm on Shuri. I think that, if anything, Shuri needs to be like Mr. Negative. Needs to be like a four negative one. I think it really needs to be that really? dramatic of an effect to maybe then yep. consider it. Because then in that lane, it goes from being what used to be a 30 power lane when you put Shuri plus Red Skull to now flipping it the complete opposite direction of, okay, well, now we've taken away three power from that lane in total. Yeah. So now it's a 27. That seems a little bit more approachable. But I think that the full full resting combination, if you really want to attack the Shuri deck and appropriately nerf Shuri, Shuri needs to be a four negative one. And we do need to go back to old red... Well. I don't know how far back we want to go. Not old Red Skull of 515, <laughs> but the revised Red Skull that were the negative yeah. one versions, I think a 512 Red Skull with the negative I one. Know, like... I think then, because think about it, because then your Shuri plus Red Skull, even if you soar on it, no matter what power you leave Sauron on, if you do that at negative one Shuri, then it's now a still pretty contestable lane but a strong lane never now you really need to have that one drop on top afterwards as a protection point because of the pain that shuri has also caused you because now it goes from instead of being right now because he's at a 514 right if yeah. and currently with shuri at one power that's still 29 power in that lane on two cards sauron or no sauron doesn't matter it's still 29 power in that lane with the Sauron, though, it's just over the top, in my opinion, for a two-card combo. Then, in the yeah. same lane. Then, look at the contestant. If you bring it down to 13, and you make her just, a negative one, now it's 25 power in that lane. And typically, think, that's all you're trying to put in that lane, right? Whenever you play that Yeah, down. but like, I don't know. I, I think the problem that we have is a lot of these cards aren't able to breathe outside of Shuri. And so when we touch them, so this is the whole discussion we had before, right? With like when they kept touching Red Skull yeah. because they're like, this is the card that works with Shuri and this is the card they always use. So let's yeah. do everything we can to, to Red Skull without touching Shuri. And then they finally touch Shuri. Like it, it's just so, it's such a weird thing because the architect itself is really good. They need a better Shang-Chi. Like the, I, I don't know what that looks like. They've tried it a couple times with Negasonic. They've tried it with other stuff. They've they've changed Shuri to where now you have to have armor into Shuri. You know, yeah. so like you have to have armor into Sauron into Shuri into Red. Sk like it is a six card. <laughs> like at this point, it's literally in order to have your perfect run, you need a two, three, four, five, six, right? And your six is usually a five because it's a Taskmaster. But like, you know what I mean? Like you have to yeah. have the perfect thing. And they have to make sure they don't have Cosmo. They don't have, you know, Shadow King. Yet. They don't have Shang-Chi. Yeah. And it still wins. It's got it's got a great win rate. But I think that's also because people keep forgetting about it. Like, when I go into matches, I don't think about Shuri at Red Skull anymore. Like, it's not a deck that I'm like, oh, I'm dreaded and I'm going to see it. But it's a, it's a highly used deck. It's a highly 
win rate, but I just don't see it that much. I don't know if that's just that's just where you. I'm at with my yeah. You got <laughs> ripped apart so. the other day for <laughs> I just don't see those anymore. I'll tell you confidently, shut the fuck yeah. up. Okay, they are so. everywhere. <laughs> I'm still running I mean, into them everywhere. I, yeah, so I I know that I know that they're out there, and it may just be I haven't hit conquest this week or whatever, and maybe that's where they're still showing up a lot. But like, yeah, I I don't know. I don't know what you do to the deck because. I think Shuri is a very interesting card, but she's the problem card. The The yeah. fact that you can double a card and then now you have to go, oh crap, I can double a card. What are these cards that I tried to make really good without Shuri that I'm having to now make worse because of Shuri? Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, if you think about it, if like, if Hulk was a five drop, you'd have to now go, oh crap, how do I fix Hulk because of Shuri? You can't, he's a six drop, so you're not going to worry about him right now. But I'm just saying like, yeah. That's that's the true nature of this thing is like it's Taskmaster copying a giant card that you played on five. So now they have right. to look at every five drop because of Shuri. And I don't know. I, I As far as the store on change. To me, it doesn't make a difference. Like they yeah, must have something no, in all. December or January that they're worried about <laughs> and they're wanting to get in front of because he's going to show up in a bunch of decks. But mm -hmm. I it's just like to me the Shuri change. Like I, I agree with you on the fact that like Shuri is so strong, she should have the negative, like Mister Negative, um, just to be like, here's your punishment for using this card. Just like we've yeah. seen with uh, Yellow Jacket, he's a zero two. He gives minus one to the card that's in the lane with him. It's it's his downfall to be such. I won't say good on stats because two power is not huge, but the fact he's free. So I I I could see that. I could see her being a. Four negative one and see what it does with the deck. I don't think you change Red Skull just yet. He got changed way too much, and I. But I don't know. It just it just means Cosmo needs I, to come back. It, People it, aren't it, playing Cosmo right now. It's a problem. That's always the problem. So. It, it comes in waves. But <laughs> let's let's acknowledge this too, specifically. Th that line that they put on with Sauron of you know we have some potential new tools planned for him yeah. in the future. Okay. Whatever those tools are, it's not in November. It's not in December. And to as much as we could potentially know, maybe not even in January. So whatever they're yep. testing that they know about right now, I mean, it's got to be something substantial for them to be thinking that yep. this is the solution for this, that this is that worthy of... Yep. Let me just take off a of power yep. here because it's really going to matter in a moment. Yep. Like, we have some really bad negative cards come. Well, I guess what you have. Uh, I've already looked. Trust me, none of them are ongoing. Wait, wait. The whole martyr. No, martyr's not ongoing. Okay. No, nope. I was thinking of martyr. But yeah, no, I, I'm way ahead. Of you. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I don't know. It's we got we got some big negative ongoing cards coming. Apparently, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe apparently. Here's the thing. It's a nihilus, right? There, there's something that's a zero power card that's a huge negative that you're gonna throw to their side. Yeah. <laughs> and this is to, to try to make it to where if you don't get your nihilist, you can still fix it. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um we'll figure like it out. A, you cannot you cannot win the game card. <laughs> yeah, we'll 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 see what they decide to bring. Cause um yeah. Maybe and maybe maybe we actually get a use for Owatu in the in the next meta too, because they finally uh, put his last power back, which is like, okay, maybe we really do think about him in C2 a bit, but that's about it. I don't think there's yeah. much to mention outside of he he's still uatu i'm, I'm gonna keep pushing for uatu until you can see both locations at one two I, and then yeah. he's good then then yeah. you really do actually consider using him in like some real decent play if you can show me both locations well go for it yeah i think i think if you conquest i think is a, a place yeah. that stands out if i could see both locations from the very beginning of the game i could instantly know if if I don't have your location change, right, or whatever, yeah. I can instantly I know that I'm going to retreat on this. Yeah. You know, I'm going to give you that one cube because literally two locations I can't play into. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree. I think that that's probably the only thing that's going to make him playable. And I don't I would, understand why that would be like, quote unquote, too powerful, just because we have so many location change cards. Yes. Like even knowing what they are, they could change. I would take Uatu at 1-1 one, one if I could see both locations. And I would probably yeah. play him in almost, you know, every other deck just because of that competitive nature of having that yeah. piece of advantage going into conquest in particular, not ladder, 
but in conquest just like how certain yeah. cards do better in certain pla- anyway um because yeah. there's not much we need to talk about with him let's be honest just like no. Hellcow, i don't think there's much we need to talk about Hellcow. you give him plus two power he's still Hellcow, and they're trying to make he's, him different than well it's the discard and, decks uh, well it's the, duh, it's the di- no duh well, I, but like i'm just saying like you look at they just touched um black cat they just they just touched a lot of these discard cards that don't that aren't being in the decks like Hellcat was everywhere in discard and then all of a sudden he Modoc. disappeared because of Modoc, right so because of the randomness of it and all of that so they're trying to be like all right well maybe the apocalypse decks let's give a little power let's you know again black cat things like that they they've continually but, touched these cards to try to make that deck better and the deck's not terrible but I think this will help the deck. I think this will help the Apocalypse. Not the Hella deck, but the Apocalypse deck. But at the yeah. same time, it's one of those things where it's just kind of like, yeah. hey, we'll probably see a little bump, but it's... Yeah, it not a substantial bump, because if you're going to pay for random, you know, it has to be at a cost, which is why Swordmaster yeah. was 3-6, and why it was hysterical yeah. that for the same 6 power, it would cost me one extra mana, but maybe I'll discard something else again. And it was yeah. just... It didn't have enough cost versus, you know, benefit. And yeah. at four eight, yeah, it's a little bit more justified. And maybe you start planning your decks a little bit differently for exactly that, the swarm apoc style decks. That's yeah. it. Like that's the only time I really feel like you end up playing Hell Cow. And maybe that two power makes enough of a difference that it's a more of a staple, but it's mm-hmm. still just an option, I think is the I- best way to word it. It's just an option. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of those where we may see a deck that crops up that can discard optimally because we have cards that can target now with Blade and things like that. Like, there is a potential somebody's going to find a really good line with Apocalypse, is going to find a really good line with maybe even um, Dakin, maybe, uh, yeah. or Dakin. Maybe maybe he comes back, like, because of, you know, you're discarding two cards and you have a higher chance of hitting the shard now uh, from your hand. But... Yeah, I, I think it's a good change. I think Hell Cow is one of those cards that a lot of people weren't playing. It's a good change to see if people will play him. Will yeah. people play him? I don't know. Maybe. With the Apocalypse decks, yeah. he probably gets slotted back in. But outside of that, again, he's very deck-specific card, and I think that's the problem with him. Agreed. Agreed. And then finally, after months of people whining and complaining appropriately <laughs> at that, yeah. Spectrum also got plus two power onto her onto her, yep. physically her and yeah. i don't know if this makes her meta relevant but it does make her more relevant i think yeah. that to make her meta relevant you'd actually have to think consider her in a surfer aspect of make her like a six three that gives plus three powers to all of your ongoings and then the ongoing deck has something maybe that makes it competitive for about a month and a half until they re-nerf it again but I think at 6-7, now you do get value out of her by playing even, you know, it's easy to play three ongoing cards in an ongoing focus deck. So to yeah. get 613 out of her in total is very, very attainable. And yeah. I think something that could, you know, maybe make an appearance as relevant. Maybe we see more Arnhem, uh, sorry, not Arnhem, more uh, armor, spectrum, destroyer decks come back I've- again because of it i've seen a couple of the thanos decks come back because of it mm. so that thanos yeah, yeah, ongoing yeah. um yep. deck is just a good deck in general so locking down a lane with professor x and then her coming down and i think that's the that's her benefit her yeah. coming down and being able to contest a lane is huge whereas before you had a lot of these lockdown whatever decks like the destroyer decks right like you you had to play destroyer on six after you already armored and whatever your other lane because he was the big card. And if you had Spectrum, there were so many games where you're just like, well, playing her at five and only buffing one or two cards in this lane can't beat <laughs> the the uh, American Chavez that's coming down, right, in yeah. that same lane to contest her. So I think that this is one of those that, yeah, to your point, does this bump up her play? It does this week. Does it over the next two or three weeks? Maybe not, unless the yeah. Thanos... Like the only deck I could see is that Thanos ongoing or going back to that original, you know, war path, uh, you know, only playing two yeah. lanes deck kind of kind of makes its rise back. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I was originally thinking is like maybe that yeah. makes a relevant appearance 
because of, you know, this small little tiny sh- I'm here. Let me put this up on the screen too. Like I had, come on, there we go. Like I was, oh, there we go. There it is on the full screen for the YouTube side. I was building up a, a Thanos zoo style deck with that exact play line in mind. You know, it's yeah. pretty much what you're thinking, you know, blue Marvel, professor X claw onslaught spectrum, the all things that can pop out of Lockjaw. You know, with the Thanos build, Iron Man, and then some core awesome ongoing cards, Cosmo, yeah. Ant-Man, and then Nico because Nico, because Nico and Thanos is absolutely fantastic. And then, as we talked about with the flexibility, the awesomeness that is Jeff. So yeah. put it all together. I thought it was something fun, something different, something relevant. I was like, maybe yeah. this is what we're looking for here when it comes to getting Spectrum in yeah. line into something relevant again is it the answer i don't know but i think it's fun and i think it's cool that she finally got the love and respect she deserves but is that the only card that you know has been cried out i know you've got cards you've wanted changed i know i've got cards i've wanted changed whether it be for a long time whether it's relevant whether it's not relevant i'm curious from your end are there any like changes that we're still missing or changes that stick out to you that whether it's something we've talked about in the past or ones that you keep hearing from the community over and over and over again, what else are we missing? Yeah, there, I think there's a bunch. I think if we look at stats of like cards that are not being used, right. Is where I always kind of start when I scroll through the list. I'm like, what's the card I haven't used since series one or two. And there's definitely a lot of those. Um, that need to be touched. But I think that when I look at cards, most of the cards are not, they need one power. They're not, they need, you know, minus one cost. What I'm looking at is more of redesigns. Yeah. Um, just because, yes, there's cards like, and and I may steal one of yours in a second, like Punisher, because I know you brought him up in the past. Like maybe if he gets plus, you know, another plus one or something per card, like maybe that makes him relevant. But like what I want to look at is like, the cards that have really cool mechanics, but you just can't use them because they're just not good enough. Um, and again, I'm going to get blown up by comments and things like that because some of the ones I'm going to be picking, I know I'm going to have some pushback on on people with them. But I'm going to start with a pair because they're very similar. They do different things. But Angel and Mbaku. I love the cards. Uh-huh. I love what they do. But the fact that if they get trapped in your hand, they're the worst cards that you can ever do, so you never have them. Yeah. I think both of these cards need to be able to jump out of your hand, and I get that that also makes them, like, way better because they're free cards in your entire deck. doesn't matter where they are, they automatically get freed. But I've also seen games where Mbaku has lost people games because he yes. jumps into, uh, what is it, Bar With No Name or, or whatever. Um, and some very stuff rare, like that. but I have seen it, yes. Yeah. So I don't know, like to me, those two cards, like Angel used to get huge love in series one and two, and then we just found way better destroy cards. Um, and then Mbaku, I, I feel like it's always just been that card that's like, he's a really cool animation, he's a really cool effect, but he just never gets used. I mean, I won't say never. He does show up in like, I think it's it's under 1% of decks, but I don't know. Yeah. I, if they jumped out of your hand, that would be so much better. And I get that that makes them a free card, but that they're also, they're one twos. Like as a free card is a one, two. And the fact you don't know where they're going to go. So I guess you would with angel. Cause you still have to destroy the card, but yeah, I don't know that that's, those are my, where I want to start. My two cards are angel and Mbaku. They need to be able to come out of your hand some way um, to make them relevant again, to be usable. And if not, I think I, you just need to. I agree. And I think then if you do that, Angel becomes a staple in your destroy decks. And it's one of the things, you know, it's funny you mention Angel because it's on it's on my list as a consideration card. Mbaku, I'm less a fan of in that aspect where it automatically drops because then it literally is just free to power anywhere at any given point. Yeah. And I'm less about that for him. But for Angel in particular, I think that maybe there could be something there specifically. Because maybe we're just looking about her thinning the deck wrong. You know, just like how we have team, you know, Chavez out there about thinning your deck and having 11 cards to deal with. Well, maybe there's a line with Angel that reinforces that for play lines on 
turns four and five. Maybe Angel is the answer to the Phoenix Four stacks. Yeah, you know, in some weird mechanic and way. You know, I don't. I, I'm not sure. Maybe there's something yeah. along that line. Um, but I get it. I think Angel's like a good one, especially in the one drop category. More so, I think I'm gonna feed into one that has been called out by several people. And the solution that I liked the most was Brad's for it. And he gets that shout out, Brad Safers in particular. I think Electra needs mm-hmm. to be a 2 2 that can destroy a random enemy two cost. Because I think that two cost cards are more impactful to have the ability to undo, uh, especially if for some reason she could override armor. I see. To me, I don't even think you need to make her a two cost. I think her ability can be kill a one or two cost. I get that that makes her like really, really strong. Yeah. But, but the fact that like Killmonger can kill like four cards on a board. Yeah. Like it, to her to be able to do one and two, it kind of like gives you an answer to Maria Hill, if that makes sense. Like because that well, one drop's going to come down plus that. And now there's, there's Maria still Hill the, doesn't need the answer. You don't need Maria well, Hill just, as an answer. You need just, to kill I'm Luke I'm just Cage. saying like, yeah. I'm just saying, like, in general, I think if you made her do a one or two drop, the randomness of who she's going to hit on that location, you know, again, if there's only one card, there's only one card. But, like, I feel like that may make it okay, a one or two, and and, her, and keep her at a one drop, I think. Because it's still, it's still in, like, makes you not necessarily want to play her on one or two, because yeah. you may be waiting on, on turn three to play her. Um and then if you're playing her on three as a two drop, that's going to really like mess with your curve. So yeah. I don't know. Especially if we get the rework for Adam Warlock that I want. Yeah. Then I think it'd be incredibly important. Um, yeah. Cause I know they talk about card draw being a huge issue all the time and something that they're always trying to protect and keep an eye on. But I think we're now at a point in the game that. Mm-hmm. You know, Adam Warlock should become a two one. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I know I said this I, for so long. I know. And I'm on your side now with it. That's my point is <laughs> I I think. Warlock now knowing the amount of card draw mechanics that we're starting to get into the game. Yeah, I don't think making him a two one is necessarily a bad thing um, anymore. I think him yeah. at two one now becomes lane control where that's how I look at it is okay I put this down into an empty lane or a projected empty lane boom there we go it forces also him become becomes more relevant against decks that don't play one drops because there are many that don't play a single one drop so you know that your chance then increases to get that card down in, in a successful lane at least for one game and especially more often than not, you're probably playing it on the right hand side. Imagine playing it with Uatu simultaneously, knowing all of the locations. You drop him down on turn two into what's going to be a Sanctum Sanctorum game. Boom! You have all your whole deck. Like, I think that he becomes relevant enough at two one now, given the amount of cards and options that are currently in the game. So I think we're still fine. I'm on your side now about him. Uh, I think Warlock two one is justified. Yeah, and. And here's the thing. He can have the nebula. I was just looking that up on my phone. He can have the nebula parentheses except this turn, right? Like I I get it. Like I I want him to come down into an empty lane and you draw cards to at least get value. But I get that. That's what everybody's complaining about is, oh, well, then you get. But I I think he works just like nebula. I think he works just like these other cards where it's lane control. You throw him down and now you're saying like, hey, if you don't contest this, I get a card. So he can have the parentheses that Nebula has, which means mm-hmm. I play him on two. I don't get any value, but now on three, I, I know do, you're I playing there. That. So, and it, yeah. and it would go back into the guardians theme that Nebula rocket, all of this has because he's part of the guardians to where you put him down and you know, on turn three, they're playing into him. So now I can play my Groot or my rocket plus, you know, star Lord. Like, right. I think that that's the way you fix them because right now, the fact that you have to play a one and there's not a lot of great ones as far as power goes right into him. And now it's like, it's pretty obvious. Like if you play 
Nebula. People are playing into that lane on turn two, which means you're not drawing a card. They're playing yeah. into it three, four, whatever. You're never drawing a card off of them. If you play, you know, um, I, I, again, like there, there's not that many powerful ones. And as soon as you play them on two, they're lane controlling you anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and you're just not getting any value whatsoever. So, yeah, I think a 2-1, I think it would help. And again, if you want to make it fair, put the parentheses, oh, accept Jean, this turn. Gene Gray. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So. That's fine. You know. Yeah. And, and again, the, I, I, yes, card draw is powerful, but I just think right now, like, he, you can't find him in a deck because nobody, like, there was the Galactus decks that played him, but now with the way Galactus works, you're never going to play him. So he, he just he he doesn't have a home. And I think that the only way to give him a home is give him power. I yeah. you know, and I think the parentheses fix him. Two okay. one, you know, accept the turn you played it, which is what Nebula says on her card, then you're you're good to go. I like that adjustment. What else you got? All right. So next up, this one. I'll save the the one that everybody's going to bring out the pitchforks till last. Okay. So this one, I still think people may have a problem with. Like I said, I think all the cards are going to I'm going to talk about. Somebody's going to have an issue with it, but a mega red. So yes, okay. there is a mega red deck. There's the whole Ben Broad special, whatever, where you're putting him onslaught, living tribunal, whatever. I think the problem with them though right now is to be up ten power means you have to play him with like Iron Man. Like you have to play yeah. a very specific all in deck on a lane in order to get this four power. And it it limits him to one deck. And I think that if you wanted to open up this card, you have to get rid of that stipulation. And if that means it needs to be plus three power instead of plus four, that's fine too. But I think this whole stipulation, I think it should be just like Crossbones you need to be winning the lane to get the bonus. And then if that, again, maybe it's plus three like Baxter building, right? Like maybe plus four isn't a thing. Maybe it's plus three. But I think right now the limiting of has to be above 10 power and he's only a five. Like you, you're having to play that living tribunal deck. You're having to play yeah. him plus Iron Man plus tribunal or him plus Iron Man plus Onslaught. And even with that, like unless you have Onslaught Citadel, his pluses aren't winning you the other lanes. So I, I think I think if you do that, you make him a four four though. Um, That's fine. Because four four, and then if you're winning this lane plus three power to the other locations, like you said, the Baxter building mentality. I say it all the time right. on stream. When Baxter building is down, I don't like to fight for it because it ends up right. being a card suck. And it's yep. easier yep. to go into the other two lanes knowing that you're already down three and yep. just invest more power into those than it is to try to try to compete for it. And so are they. And they're yeah, they're going to fight for it. So you tease the fighting with maybe a card or two at most. But going into yep. it, that in turn five and six, you're not fighting for Baxter building. And yep. now you you move ahead. I think that strategy then going up against Omega Red in general I think then would be fine. Um, maybe you consider making him instead of a four five, then maybe you consider making him like just a three, four instead. Yeah. I, I would yeah, be cool it, with that because then I think he's a, a or a three, even three, 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 three that gives yeah. threes like. Yeah. And, and, and again, I'm wanting I wanted to also caveat that every card I'm going to talk about has a less than one percent play rate. So Which like makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's like I love because yeah. I love that Ben Broad special that I've used for a long time. I used to use it a lot before we got these whole ladder rankings. <laughs> now that we have ladder rankings, like the deck's just hard to win with uh, because you That's can't fine. just have fun anymore. But it's it's definitely one of those like right now. There's been so many matches where like having to have that ten power above their power is so hard into a lane, mm -hmm. and unless you're playing like quote unquote unfair cards with him to where you're going to get some crazy advantage. And usually that means you have to be playing with, you know, this, this Iron Man plus onslaught or you're on onslaught Citadel. Like you have to have something boosting his power. So yeah. Yeah. I, again, I would love, I would love to just remove that piece of it 
Um, and if that means you got to tweak his power and his cost, if that means you have to tweak it from being plus four to plus three, like that's totally fine. Because even if it's plus three, being able to onslaught and make it plus six, again, plus six on a lane that you're only contesting into one lane the whole time, like you're still not going to win the game. But if you're able to now not have that plus 10 and you can just win a location by one point and now have plus six everywhere else because you have, you know, a four, four plus a seven, right. Um, of onslaught on that location, plus a one drop or two drop you played like that can win a lane by one or two points. And it makes them have to play into it. And it makes them have to know that it's a potential that all of a sudden you can come out of nowhere. Like you can do your math and go, okay, well, they're at this and Iron Man's the only card they could play on turn six on this location, which means they they lose all these locations for that plus 10 right now. So I don't know. It's it's just one of those. See, he's a he's a pet card. I like him. I like Omega Red. I loved him in in the old X-Men animated series. Mm -hmm. um just as a character so like get, give him some love make him playable again yeah i because that's exactly it he needs to be <laughs> playable again which is yeah. you know right in line with one of my choices that i didn't mean it, i didn't plan it like this but i had just put up a post for ccg hub on mm -hmm. their twitter x whatever you want to call it and with the same mindset because i think that strong guy is the exact same way I think strong mm -hmm. guy is one of those cards that people just don't play for all of the yep. understandable reasons. And now how do you fix them? Because we've looked at different versions of trying to fix them repeatedly. Yep. So I put it up on CCG hub and I, I just simply said, fix this card because this card is just straight up. Let's be honest. No one's playing him. Just be honest. He's, okay. No well, one's playing he's strong hard. guy. He's hard to play. Like the only the only line that's reliable is five. So you don't play Apocalypse. You don't play Swarm. The only line, I guess, technically you can play Swarm, but the yeah. only line you have is Modok on, on five. Draw, you Chavez. know, draw Chavez and Chavez on six. Like, yeah, it's not good. You know, may, I guess maybe technically if you could get like Zabu, so you get an early Dracula. And then you still have like, no, because Apocalypse still goes back in your hand. So like, yeah, I there, there's really not a great line to have an empty hand. And I don't feel like maybe way back in the day with the Gambit um, uh, Zodia, Exodia decks. Like, yeah. I feel like that's the only deck I've ever had, like no cards in hand at the end of the game. Right. Um, Modok on six would be the other way or like a Modok on five plus Chavez. Like there's not many ways to have a an empty hand. And I think that that's like his downfall. So I put it out to the community and there was one in particular I liked that inspired what I think the, the solution for strong guy would be. And if we scroll down two different people had said it, uh, Patrick and Jim here, which was 410 ongoing negative one for each card in your hand. I like, that. and I was going to spin it the, a little bit further. Cause I think that's too powerful. I think it would be better mm -hmm. as a 410 minus two because then yeah. you're still looking even if you have two cards in your hand which is very normal and doable and you can yeah. kind of work around that's the four six which is a good stat line so to get remember if you're looking at that four eight four nine four ten stat line there has to be a negative effect yeah. and four drops like to peak at 10 and that's what he does in his current condition so sure if you get no yeah. cards in your hand you can get your four ten but even one card in your hand at four eight or two cards in your hand, which is very doable and mix in at four six as a uh oh scenario. Mm -hmm. I think that that then makes him okay enough where, yep. okay, now it's a decent stat line. Otherwise, maybe four nine with the negative one each card in your hand. Like, I think yep. something along those lines where the less weights, the easier it is for him to be strong. That's my yep. mentality for lore of he's a strong guy. So the more that he has on him, the weaker he is just because it's more yeah. weight, more cards in your hand, make him weaker and weaker and weaker, no matter how strong he is. But if there's no weights, then he's at his full strength. Right. So yeah. that's, that's and, the mindset I look at. And there were some good ones in here mixed in too. Yeah. And, and he's one of those cards when, when we were talking about like what cards we want to see get updated, now, you're not necessarily OTA, but just updated in general. He's always on the list, and he is the least played card in Marvel Snap. 
uh, based again, depending on what website you're on and all your tracking stuff and all that. So, you know, second dinner maybe actually has the real stats over us, but based on what we've seen, he is one of the lowest played cards and he, yeah, he needs some help. They've tried to, they've tried to help him, but his, his mechanic in general is just a really bad mechanic yeah. because we don't have enough discard your stuff. And again, because of that, he goes into a very specific deck. Like, yeah. And, what, um, and again, I, I like the minuses though. What else do you kind got? Of forgiveness. If you have any others, good sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So I've got one more. I've got a couple more, but I've got one more that I'll, I'll kind of hit. Um, which this is the pitchfork one. This is the one everybody's going to be mad at me for saying. Oh God! Uh, because nobody's going to agree. What'd you do? But Kingpin, I Ooh, think he's on my list. I, so hang on. Okay, okay, he's on my list. Go on. King, all right. So this is what I'm saying with Kingpin. I think Kingpin can go back to a five, but I think his ability should be whenever a card moves here, it gets destroyed. It should be the location. And I think that as a three drop, no, that would be busted. I, I put him at three and I start throwing stuff into it with Stegron and all that. Right. Like, I get that. But I think if he had his original, his original, whatever he was at, at a five drop, and then just said, if a card gets moved here on from whenever, so five and six, yes, you could maybe get lucky off of like a, a lock jaw to get him out earlier or something. But like, a, you know, I, I think he should destroy something every single turn. I think... The fact that he's so hard to get people to move something into his lane on turn six makes him non-playable um, yeah. because of that fact. And I think it needs to happen every turn. But again, if that's the case, I'm fine with him being a five drop, not a three drop. I had a very similar thing. Uh, I have Kingpin at four five, any movement, any turn. Yeah. Yeah. So Same, same idea, but at four because i agree at three it would just be too broken given the game yeah um but to play him down on four so that way it happens on five and six sure you can cheat yeah. it out or you can try to go for prio leading into it sure but i agree i think that he needs to have this turn six bs removed from him and then yeah. adjust accordingly to that because he should be a strong card and he just straight up isn't he needs yeah. to be, especially given all of the move in this game right now. Yeah, this would be you, a huge win for a tech card. Yeah, he'd be he'd be kind of like a Professor X in a way, right? A Professor X just says you can't move into this lane, right? Or you can't play into this lane. Uh, you can't move to, but know, this one's kind of that same way where you just go, "Hey, movement! This is a lane that you can't mess with, and if you want to go for it, go for it." Yeah. But like. He's just going to stop this lane. It, but if you look at every other deck, like every other deck would be like, sure, whatever. I'm not moving, uh, you know, but it, it stops a Jeff. It does. It does a lot of stuff in the meta to where I think he would be a fine card to do that with. And realistically, currently, the only cards that would like you would be able to like. Combo with them, which are good cards, would be your Magneto and your Stegron. So I do. Arrow. And that's why I think Arrow. at. Yeah, an arrow. So, like, I think that that's why, like, out of five, I think it's fine because you're still only kind of doing, like, your combo, if they're not movement, right? Your combo is still only on a turn six, but it stops the movement decks that are cropping up all the time, and it stops a Jeff. It makes you have to move your Jeff early. And maybe it's, maybe to your point, maybe it is a four drop is, is where he needs to be, so you have arrow on five, Magneto on six, or something like that, but... I do worry that that's a little too strong. Yeah. Um, with those two. Maybe. But even again, we but, have a location that does it already. Yeah. From from turn one. So true. This is very true. You know. I think. Uh, yeah. And uh, Kingpin hundred percent needs the the love. In the, in the same aspect of the whole like move and destroy thing, I'll give you my last one. Um, yeah. Especially because we also have who we'll talk about after this werewolf by night coming to the game soon. I think that timing would be great to have Kingpin adjusted. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to put one more out there because it's probably if I had to guess without looking at it, probably one of the lowest five play rate cards. Also, um, Spider-Man 2099. Yeah, I think that the solution for Spider-Man 2099, where it specifically says the first time this moves to a location, destroy an enemy card there. Yeah, I think you change him by making him a three five. 
just like Spider-Man, classic Spider-Man, not Miles, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. Spider-Man at a 3-5, and then it says, each time this card moves, destroy an enemy card. I think you give him the ability to destroy multiple cards. And then I, it's interesting. I, I agree with your text change. I do not agree with him going to a three. Um, he's only got to play him down to get him to move. Either way, he's not killing anything until turn four. Anywho. No, that not true. So with Nico plus Iron Fist, you can do it on three. Ghost Spider can do it again sure. on four. Like, uh, but, but I agree then, with you. Uh, like, cloak, I think he needs play to be able to on do five, it. and then he moves on six. Either way, you're still killing yeah, like, at most three cards. Even in that scenario, at most, three I know. Cards. But but three cards is a lot when he doesn't die, like Negasonic. So, I, but I, I agree with you on the fact that like the first time needs to go away. But I think at a four, he's still fine. You can still do the three cards, right? You can still do Iron Fist, whatever on three. Him come down on four. Yeah, Ghost do it on five. You know, and then you also play cloak on a different lane like you can still do the three yeah. but it's a lot harder to do the three um at a four cost compared to at a three cost i feel like you have a little more time to wait at a three cost but i agree mm -hmm. with you i think that the first time needs to go away because even with that like you're you're investing a lot of cards to make him kill three cards maybe um, so maybe you change have to so maybe you there. find the happy middle ground and you change it to each time this loose moves to a new location so that way it can't kill two cards in the same location. So it can kill yeah. one card from each of the three locations. So I now can... you're playing the location synergy game on both ends of it, where it's like, all right, you've already killed a card in the left lane because you just moved yeah. over. Or you're trying to get that Heimdall on turn six, so you need to know that you're playing it into the left lane on turn, you know, turn three, yeah. moving it to the far right on turn four, then into the mid on turn five, and then Heimdall moves it over on turn six. Like then there's like a little bit of a projected play pattern for him, where then yeah. both sides are trying to play in and or around it. So that I think might be the solution. So just I, that checks change in particular. Yeah, I mean, I like I like the idea around it. I, I think that the and again, I'm I don't want to get too far into the dev's head because being a dev i think about these things a lot but like the i don't know what that looks like as far as knowing when it's like maybe it's hovering over spider-man and it shows you like an x over the location or something i don't know but they would have to also build a whole new mechanic within the game to show you where he should where he can and can't destroy stuff but i mean they have some of that stuff in place i guess already with uh when you hover over lady death strike or you're going to player it shows you yeah what will die and stuff like that but yeah, I, again, I agree with you. I think the first time, I think it's too limited on this card, which is the reason why he doesn't get play right now. I don't think his cost is the issue. I think his cost is just this issue of like, all right, I get one time to blow something up. It's a random card at the location. And in most games, you don't know what you're going to hit on that location. This isn't like Shuri Red Skull situation, yeah. right? Um, and But I do think having Nico now giving you that plus Iron Fist, you having Ghost Spider... You're having uh, Heimdall. You're you're having a lot of ways to move them around. So I do like the fact that you could you could do something interesting. The other the other thing that would be ridiculous at a three, and this is the reason why I would not want him to be a three. Mm. And think through this line. Uh, I play him on three. Mm -hmm. um, I play Nico on two. I play him on three to kill him. I play Phoenix Force on four. <laughs> And now I move them on five and six, and I'm getting a bunch of different kills as well off of that. That's where um, the the unique so. lane lo the unique lane location assignment of once per location. Yeah, then I think the once per location good. maybe maybe helps fix that, so it's a max of three. But yeah, like the but then then you the can even get super Phoenix. cheeky. Oh, I just think, what if you change the location? I don't know. It depends yeah. if they if they look at location as the the uh it's the it, say the location of the location, but like you know what I mean. Yes. Compared no, to the, the location lane of the number. location matters because think of things like Shuri, where if the locations move or change, her effect doesn't work. The ability it always assigns to the name of the location, not the actual yeah, yeah. left, mid, right of the location. Okay. So okay. then I think there's even more play lines involved, and then he becomes yeah. an exciting card. Where, yes, it's about power, but simultaneously, it's also about maintenance. 
And when do you decide to destroy a card by moving 2099? And when do you not? Do you change a location yep. to get another opportunity there to kill a second card there or not? Then he becomes exciting. I think right now he is just a dud. And I think the yeah, numbers prove I that. I think they know that. And I think they're fearful of exactly what you're fearful of, the ability to kill too many cards on the opponent's side of the battlefield. Yep. My argument to that would be rocks. If you have a card that can put out closing off two locations, specifically yep. to your opponent, uh, sorry, two uh, spots to your opponent, you know what? You can have a card that also destroys as well. We have shang Chi's, yep. we have Electra's, we have other destroy and clogging mechanics. This is in that same light. And I think that he yep. deserves that kind of respect by having the ability to kill multiple cards. I can, I can predict that if they take this off, I, I bet you for them to try it, he's going to go to a five. Now, I agree with you. And like, I think you should be able to kill a bunch of cards, but I bet you they're, they're, um, their valve <laughs> yeah their safety valve yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll say we're going to take this text off we're going to make him a five so at most you're going to kill like two two cards maybe you know, three like, if you're lucky yeah but um but i agree with you i think i think this text needs to change because yeah. it's what's killing them it, it's the thing of like negasonic right like i and i'm not bringing it up as like the next card that needs to be changed but the problem with negasonic is the fact that like i play this card and it dies and i lose my card too and the upside of Spider-Man 2099 is you don't lose your card. But right now, it's just like the one kill is just not enough. Agreed. Not enough to justify him in the decks. Yeah, especially at that stat line. 100%, yeah. I agree. And now, because it's been a hot minute, now you might want to play 2099 to see how bad he really could be. But here I am I, wanting yeah, to play I, all these bad cards, and I'm still not even infinite, so it's not even worth my time. But I just keep falling because of stupid, fun ideas like this. But simultaneously, yeah. if we can get all those movements to happen... One of the cards that I think that would be almost yep. a mandatory synergy would be next week's card. Because yep. I think that it would just be stupid, yet absolutely fantastic. And that's Werewolf by Night. I think Werewolf yep. by Night really does bring out a fun mechanic. And watching, I can't wait to see him like in full action, like hopping around the battlefield, where he's, yep. for those who don't know, he's a 3 3, just a standard, you know, static ability. After you play an on reveal card at another location, move there and gain two power. So getting him down on turn three, he has a lot of potential to hop all over the place yeah. and just keep getting, you know, three to five to seven to nine to plus. Getting him to scale up is going to be incredibly easy, in my opinion. I, I would agree. I, I, they should I, have changed these, this text. I, so we talked about this too, and it's it's a so you guys know, yes. It's just when you play a non reveal, not when it triggers. So Correct. this was something I when I first read that I was like, oh, it'll be fine. You just play a Cosmo, and then when we were talking, mm -mm. like no, yep. we had even, even Cosmo stopping the on reveal, he still moves and and pluses. I think that that's a that's an oversight that should be like I know it's not an oversight because they know about it, but like that's an oversight in the way this works. I think it should have been when one of your on reveals trigger. But I also know that they're probably worried about like an Odin, like re-triggering them when you re-trigger your stuff. But like, I don't know. I don't like the fact that like you can stop the on reveal, but you still can't deal with this werewolf. That's going to be huge um, because now if he's really big, like theoretically, you could hide him into a Cosmo lane um, and then just not play on reveals afterwards. And it can't be dealt with. He can't be Shang Chi. He can't be Taskmaster because he's hiding behind a Cosmo now, because you played yeah. a non-reveal oh. into the Cosmo. Oh, and that's that's so. going to be the play line I'm working with next week, hundred yeah. percent. Is I'm playing a Surfer deck with Cosmo and Werewolf by Night, but the Surfer deck has only a certain amount of cards and then a whole bunch of one drops afterwards. Yeah. So my ideal situation is I'm trying to build a Surfer deck without Brood, where instead of Brood, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of one drops that make that werewolf go whop it a whop it a whop it a whop it a whop all over the place. And then yep. maybe, and who knows, maybe there's going to be some unique pairings and synergies like werewolf by night in, with Taskmaster. You know, getting that mm. build and build you, and build because it moves and then you yeah, task Taskmaster wouldn't see him. No, not him. You're not Taskmastering him. Oh, I Just gotcha. to Taskmaster gotcha. any card hidden have it bounce and bounce and bounce, and then just that be the final reveal. Like th there's a couple of different ways you. that I I'm looking at the line because 
I agree. The the play for Werewolf by Night is to ideally have him hide behind Cosmo towards the second half of the match, or ideally yeah. turn six just in case for your Shang Chi's, because yeah. it's going to be hard to get him to nine power, possibly on turn five, and also know where he's going to be to Shang Chi him. But you need him to be like Werewolf, and then he hides. <laughs> yeah, or Shadow King because he's definitely made a huge that resurgence. Too. Yeah, that with too. Elsa and cards. Hundred percent. That too. But I think yeah. he's just, you know, because there's not too much to talk about him yet because we're going to go into more detail, you know, after playtesting him and going through it in next week's episode. I just want it to be known that I think Werewolf by Night is going to be a good card, yeah. probably like a B tier level card. But I think it really depends on how people decide to move around the battlefield. And I think I still I'm leaning also towards I talked about it last week that uh, on Reveal Zoo. I think is going to be relevant with him. I think that that makes an appearance in some weird manner where he goes yep. down on three, you play your Kazar on four and your uh, blue Marvel on five and then move him everywhere on turn six by going pew, 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 pew. Yeah, and yeah. he just scales up because well, you're yeah, playing and you Korg squirrel and squirrel. Yes. Right? Korgs and squirrels and ice bands and all these things. Like yeah. you just get all the one drops on turn six, which is going to end up being the strategy. And yeah. I think that that ends up being huge for him. I think he's a card that's going to, and this is just my, my thought to make sure everybody has caution with him. I think he's going to look like a broken card. I don't think he's going to be a broken card, but I think we're going to get a lot of shorts, a lot of shorts and a lot of streamer videos that are going to make him look insane. But the fact of like trying to get him to be this giant thing, you're going to have to play a lot of like, I don't want to say bad cards, but you're going to like for him to be this huge werewolf, you're going to have to play a lot of on reveals, which to your point, you're going to play like the zoo or whatever. You're going to play a lot of little ones and twos that do reveals. Right. And I think he's going to look insane. But then when you look at the overall stuff, you're going to be like, OK, he's he's OK. Like, yeah, because, again, you can you can hide him behind some stuff. I mean, if you think about even destroy decks. So you like you're playing like your your Deadpool uh, and things like that, like he's going to move into after the kill, after the carnage kill, after the the venom kill, and he's going to be able to kind of tuck himself behind those cards to where mm-hmm. he doesn't get eaten, but he's going to keep getting to go up and up while he moves around. So like he's going to find some weird decks or different decks to kind of plug into. Um, but I don't think like, again, going back to Nico, as we you know go into our next little piece, uh, I think he's not going to be to the same level as like a Nico card, but yeah. I think he's going to be a fun card uh, that people are going to pick up and and think he's interesting. And he's again not having, uh, not having this be like um, ongoing or something like that is a good thing. To where literally it's Taskmaster and or if you get him big enough like a Shang Chi, those are going to be the ones you have to watch out for. Yeah, and I'm saying, and again, just to make it clear, I'm not saying Taskmaster the Werewolf. That makes no sense. I'm saying play other cards and then pull him into that Taskmaster and lane I meant, as I meant a Shadow King. Sorry. Oh, okay. No, but yeah. what I what I, Shad- for example, one of the lanes I'm looking at, the lines I'm looking at specifically, yeah. is Werewolf into Shuri into Doc Ock. I think that that combination for that lane of okay. getting that Doc Ock in the Shuri lane, because yeah. now you've automatically got a three five placed into that lane. And then yeah. you've got the backup plan of saying, okay, let me put down the 20, to- 20 power Doc Ock. So now in total, you've yeah. automatically got 26 power built into that lane. Your final right. turn, you then decide, am I playing it on reveal to move Werewolf out? Or yeah. am I playing something else to keep Werewolf in? And yeah. that's a line that's also incredibly exciting. And this is what I'm saying, that he's a good card because there are different ways yeah. to look at how you want the synergies to work. I'm excited for that. Whether it's a zoo line, yeah. a surfer line, or the Shuri Doc Ock line, I think that Werewolf has good possibilities coming. I'd agree. Um, I'd agree. But you did, you did mention something, and I kind of want to revert back to it, and it's a little bit personal because it kind of goes between, you know, with us in particular. Uh, it has to deal with creators specifically right now in, in Marvel Snap. And we talk about it here mm-hmm. a lot here on this channel because there are a plethora of us right and it's one of the best things about this community is that there are literally hundreds of creators playing marvel snap internationally yet alone you know u.s domestically we have hundreds of creators that play this game 
And there was a huge announcement that came on by, which I think is going to actually tremendously affect the Marvel Snap community, which is that mm. Twitch now changed its TOS, where streamers are now permitted to multi-stream on multiple platforms. And this was yep. something that they've slowly started to roll out. They first allowed it where if it was on a short form platform like TikTok, you could live stream on Twitch while also live streaming on TikTok because it's short form first. And right. they thought that was going to be a huge win, but it just ended up being a mild win because they didn't necessarily think about how many people have the ability to live stream on TikTok because it is yeah. a whole nother mechanic. It's a whole nother layout. It's a whole nother stream. And you also need certain qualifications of TikTok followers to also even qualify to live stream on TikTok or Instagram yeah. live or whatever it may be, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's always about the, the big three when it comes to live streaming this game or any game for that matter. And that's yeah. Twitch, YouTube, and Kick. And let me just be first and foremost and say, nobody go use Kick. Personal thoughts right there excluded, okay? There's no reason to go play on, on Kick. Just don't. Do yourself a favor. Yeah. Don't promote this energy into that community because we don't want that community necessarily into this energy. Um, but YouTube is the big one. And I, I want to talk about live streaming on, on both platforms in particular because it's something I, I've gone through that journey, right? I was a live streamer on Twitch forever. And then I moved over to YouTube in my last game for about three, four months exclusively. And then came back to Twitch when so, one also coming back to coming to Marvel Snap in the beginning of the year. And mm -hmm. I went through that journey and I, and I experienced streaming on Twitch and I saw some, some success streaming on Twitch. And I mean, sorry, on YouTube, I saw some success streaming on YouTube, but it's not the same as the Twitch community. And right. all creators know that discoverability on Twitch has always sucked. And Twitch is trying to mm -hmm. updo that now. They're adding on, you know, you, the featured clips. They're adding on yeah. stories now. They're adding on new things to make the Twitch experience better and better and better. But the live stream is the, is the heart of what Twitch is. And they mm -hmm. do have right now the best live stream experience for both a creator and a viewer, in my opinion. Yeah. But YouTube well, offers... And discoverability uh, yeah, is and another huge thing. Yeah. YouTube offers better discoverability for not just the creator, but also even for the live stream when live. Technically, it is easier to discover via searching mechanics in the moments that you're live versus for someone who's not following you versus Twitch, where the landing page, the homepage, the recommendeds, the yeah. suggesteds, that's its own opportunity. But Twitch came forward with these announcements with certain regulations in line that yes, you could technically do it, but just know that there are some things you can and cannot do. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I think you're going to start seeing a spillover between the two communities tremendously. I think you're going to start seeing those who are YouTube focused first, like we already saw Cozy, mm -hmm. uh, Cozy Snap just came back to live streaming on his Cozy, Cozy Gamer channel. Regis is YouTube is very heavily specifically a YouTube success story first, streamer yeah. second. I think uh, Drew Berry was live streaming on YouTube and he's been debating about streaming on over on Twitch and now he has reasons and permissions to do so. But Twitch put up certain regulations saying that, for example, you can't relay or show chats from the other platforms. So you can't have your YouTube chat integrated with your Twitch chat. Yeah. And this was the biggest thing that everybody went, what in the ever living hell? So I, I, I'm going to monologue on this a bit because of what I know, what my past experiences are, and also new information that came out last night about that specifically. So we're going to get YouTube audiences coming over to Twitch. We're going to get YouTube live stream audiences coming over to Twitch. And we're also going to get Twitch users going over to YouTube to try that experience and also looking at YouTube videos that way. We're going to have that mix and mingle. What Twitch is yeah. trying to preserve is the idea of what the Twitch community specifically is. Not the streamer community of that individual streamer, but the experience of being in Twitch for a live stream. Hype trains, mm -hmm. raids, emotes, you know, everything yeah. that happens in a Twitch chat that the viewer experiences versus what the streamer is ingesting to put out as content. So having those chats going back and forth and mixed, 
you may potentially, and this is one of the things YouTube, uh, sorry, that Twitch is concerned about, is you may sacrifice your performance because you're integrating with multiple platforms. You're sorry, you're uh, you're interacting with multiple platforms, and people went. So why can't we just merge the chats together and talk? And yeah. Dan Clancy, the CEO of Twitch, last night went on Harris Heller's uh, live stream. For those who don't know who Harris Heller is, he is primarily a content creator for content creators, is the best way to describe what he does. He puts out yeah. a lot of material focused on live streaming, on video production, uh, tech equipment, things of that nature. So... He went on to his, Dan, the CEO, went on to his live stream last night where Harris Heller had the restream merged together chat on screen while they were talking specifically and talked to him about this specific topic. And I want this to be very well known through the creators of the community. First off, if you haven't seen the interview, go on to Harris Heller's Twitch and go watch the whole thing. It's about an hour. And he's yeah. probably going to put it up on YouTube as well. So go check it out. But the biggest thing that he talked about was the idea that moderation and especially how trolls work in gaming communities is what Twitch is worried about. The idea that if, say, a, a hate raid comes into a Twitch chat, you've got the tools in place in Twitch chat where it's like, okay, you went into slow mode, you banned all these people, you got rid of all this, you removed it from your screen. It shows a history of events in Twitch, right. not just what's on screen, it shows the history of these are the moderation actions that you took to prevent that type of content from further being displayed or further being broadcast on your channel. But yeah. if I'm showing the YouTube chat and say I ban someone on Twitch and then they say, screw it, I'm going to go over to YouTube and continue to spread my hate and it shows up on screen because you're showing YouTube chat. Yeah. That's now the responsibility of the streamer because, sure, you can say you removed it. You can show that you removed it on the live stream, but the history and the tracking of that doesn't exist. And that is what could be a punishable or even bannable offense by Twitch because you there's no proof in showing that you moderated that interaction oh, yeah. via the internal tools that Twitch can see. They can only see what's on the screen. And right. that's something that I just did where I went on through today and I, cause I show both chats right now. I've, I'm now streaming on both. I'm now live streaming on Twitch and YouTube simultaneously. And yeah. I didn't change my settings. I'm still streaming at 1080p. I didn't change anything about my links. I didn't change anything cause I have a monetized streamer agreement where I'm not exclusive to Twitch. I can stream on both platforms. So I have my YouTube chat separate from my Twitch chat and I can mm -hmm. turn both on and off as needed in both of my scenes. Uh, sorry, in all of my scenes. I can activate the sources. I can deactivate the sources. It's already done. I had that set up just in case as my, like, kill switch, which every streamer should also have anyway. Yeah, yeah. But hearing last night that they're worried about the moderation specifically is what I think is worth talking about a bit because we're gonna see a mix in this community of new views going to each of yeah. the platforms and yes twitch doesn't want you leaving its platform to go watch on youtube and youtube doesn't want you leaving youtube to go watch on twitch let's be honest here yeah. neither of you want that and that's not my job as a creator my job as a creator is to give you the best visual experience no matter where you choose to watch youtube videos are its own thing you go to youtube for youtube yeah. videos if you also want to go to a live stream there go there but if not then go watch on twitch so yeah. as a creator, I feel like the Marvel Snap community is going to feel this specific effect because we're going to see more people come to the community to watch live streams, no matter which platform it is. And simultaneously, I think streamers for those who are primarily only streaming Marvel Snap are now going to start integrating into YouTube, which is going to bring more audience to Marvel Snap, in my opinion, also. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of in the same spot as you. Like, I, it's a good thing because both platforms offer two unique things. Um, but they're trying to kind of both be the same. <laughs> so, like, yeah, you know, li like your point, like Twitch is awesome when I'm live. I get a lot of people that you get the notification, you get to go interact. It's an awesome spot. But people don't 
tend to watch your VODs. Yes, VODs are there. You can click on them. And if you're you're a diehard fan of theirs and you had something going on last night, you can go back and watch the VOD. You can click through it. You can do whatever. It's great. But it is a different world than YouTube where people go to YouTube for a nine minute, a, a 15 minute video that's fully edited. That's right, right to the point. I get where I'm going and streaming is fairly new. Now, I think one of my issues I have with with YouTube is discoverability and the fact that, yes, I can find my great creators. I can type in Marvel Snap and bam, I see these videos with 200,000 views, 50,000 views, whatever. They look great. The, the thumbnail catches me. But like right now, when I go and type in Marvel Snap and I'm looking for live streams, I have to stroll down. Let's see. One, Quite two, a bit. three, four, five, six, seven, eight videos before I hit Jeff, who's live streaming right now. And it says he has one person watching, right? But we know if you go on Twitch, he's got over a thousand Thousands. people watching him on Twitch, yeah. right? Like, so it's, it's, and that's normal. It's one of those, right. And it's one of those things where like, if we had a section on YouTube just to go like live, just like you do on Twitch, here's all well, the live streams well, and here's you Marvel do. Snap. You do, but it's awful. <laughs> well, no, 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 <laughs> but YouTube. you don't though. So you, you do. do, but you don't. If you go to the live, unless they've changed this over the last little bit, one, it's hard to find. But if That's you get the there, if you get there, it only shows you the top streaming games currently. It doesn't show Thank you every game. Correct. So like if right. you're you're it's streaming awful. on Marvel Snap, right? Like you're not going to be able to Marvel Snap isn't going to show up when, when you look at things like Fortnite. Uh, Modern Warfare, all the games that have thousands of people watching them, like Marvel Snap's category doesn't even show up. And that's the problem. You can't just go Marvel Snap like mm -hmm. you can on Twitch and see all the creators uh, streaming. So I, I think that there's some things that need to happen to make YouTube be a place where you go for streaming. But I would agree with you. I think that this is a huge thing because there's a lot of people that watch particular creators like Cozy and uh, Alex or, or whoever's out there and they go, Hey, if they were live, I'd watch them, but I don't know about Twitch. I don't know what Twitch is. I don't, I don't right. want to go over there and create an account uh, and understand what's there. But I, you know, there, there's pros and cons. I, I think Twitch is doing yeah. a great thing with the emotes, uh, channel points, all kinds of interactions you can do. Um, but it is interesting that literally I didn't even think about it. And I'm sure a lot of people didn't think about this modding thing being the reason you can't get the chats in there. Right. But after you kind of went through that, it makes perfect sense of, and that's, you know, that's exactly what Harris said, <laughs> where it's like, know, I, I wish that was clearly <laughs> communicated. I'm like, yes, yeah. that makes sense now rather than, Oh, yeah. we just don't want you to show YouTube. No. Yeah. It's if that yeah. happens, how do we know that you modded it? Right. Right. And again, like, we like, you gotta have the tools a, in place. Well, and from a streamer, right? Like I don't think that I've personally, ever been hate rated or anything like that right like you're lucky there's certain well, yeah no i mean i'm just saying like i know this happens to a lot of people right everybody who was trying to play the harry potter game when it came hate. out right <laughs> like there, yeah. there's plenty of things that have triggered these hate raids and so like yeah i would say for and it's also probably because i only stream like twice a week in yeah. general as well um but i'm just saying like I, it makes perfect sense once that's laid out there because I haven't come from the world that I get, you know, whatever. Now I get the occasional like, hey, well, you can buy fans if you no, do this and that, no. right? That you that you Stupid. kick off. And I, I guess yeah. I could see that being annoying if that's constantly popping up from the YouTube side and you're like, all right, well, the modding tools, again, I haven't streamed on YouTube a lot, so I don't know what their tools look like compared to Twitch's tools and if yeah. they're just as easy because I know on Twitch... We've got awesome mods like uh, Lori and, and all these guys that help us with our streams and, and Bude and a few others. Like, we know we have these awesome mods that help us out. I don't know of anybody that I'm like, I, I don't have anybody because I haven't really streamed on YouTube to say like, here's my mods on YouTube that are also looking for those same things. So right. I think that's another thing that's going to be interesting as people try to double stream. You're going to need mods on both sides. You're going to need people who can take, yeah. care, take care of that kind of yeah. stuff. And people may not be thinking about that. Oh, right yeah. Now. No, I mean, I've, and that's one of the things from the YouTube side that I definitely saw all the time where randomly I'd be on there and all of a sudden I get a, a comment from xxsex69life.com, <laughs> you know, looking for more followers or would like to talk to someone, join us on yeah. our site, you know, and it shows up in the, it, just like it happens yeah. with mods and trying to buy, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, with bots trying to buy follows and you get, 
all these, you know, yeah, yeah. buy follows.com kind of craps, you know, that show up in Twitch chat, you go yep. in there and you ban it. And yep. now that kind of stuff, believe me, I know from experience it happens. So yep. now I had to build into my kill switch. I hit one button. It automatically puts me for Twitch and it does it for both. It puts me into my BRB yep. screen, puts me into slow mode, uh, subscribers only for every 30 seconds, clears the chat, erases the chat, and now yep. has to automatically pop up a new window with my YouTube dashboard on it. So that yep. automatically opens. So it's right there front and center. The second I hit it, boom, and I have to like go over to the window. It opens a brand new window. I can go on in, mod the chat, and then undo it, and then go back into the live stream. So that yep. way, if something does appear in the chat that I don't want there, or there's someone on the YouTube side that I don't want there being advertised, yep. guess what? I have to hit that button now. So I'm ready for that. And it's not yeah. a hard thing to do as a streamer. Every streamer should have a kill switch. But from a viewer and from a, someone who's ingesting content, like you're ingesting this yeah. podcast, right? There are certain things you just don't want interfering with your view experience. And hate is one of them. So Absolutely. you need to be ready for that. And you need to have all the proper tools in place to take care of that. So if you're going to live stream, understand this. Yes, you can show a mixed chat. No, it's not as easy as it seems for a creator to moderate multiple platforms at once. So there is a give and take from both ends of it. We want larger communities, and I want my YouTube community to come to Twitch, and I want my Twitch community to mm -hmm. go to YouTube. But I also have to be careful to not break certain terms of service in doing so because YouTube doesn't yep. want people leaving its platform to go watch on Twitch, nor does the other right. way around. Like one of the things on my giant fucking to-do list today is to go edit my about me sections and change my chat commands because I no longer want to put a chat command that says, you know, here's my discord. Boom. And there's the, or sorry, here's my YouTube. Boom. And it sends it over and clicks a link, yeah, yeah. which sends you from Twitch to YouTube now that I'm multi-streaming on both. That would show yeah, yeah. off a potential trigger. I don't want to promote that. If you want to, go to my About Me section, which shows yeah. this. Click this button right here. That's all I have to say right now. Yeah. I'm not going to put that link in the chat and vice versa over on YouTube. Have all that ability and that information set up. Yep. It's just, it's that kind of stuff that creators have to pay attention to for Marvel Snap because the community yep. is going to benefit from this overall. But don't be surprised Absolutely. from creators like even Binks, who's an experienced multi streaming creator for months before they had other regulations come into line. And now he's right. doing it again. Someone who's well, shown success. Don't be surprised right. if and there are hiccups along the way. And Binks was a good example because there was a long time where he wouldn't become an affiliate on Correct. Twitch yeah. because he wanted to double stream, which means you lose out on any kind of donations. You lose out on a bunch yeah. of that stuff uh, by doing that on the Twitch side. So it's it's a great thing that they're doing. Again, you know, from and if you're a Twitch streamer, the benefit here is, I mean, even though people may not click it, it's free YouTube content. <laughs> like your VODs get saved on your YouTube. And I think that that's the one big thing. Every time I looked at YouTube and, and streaming over there, I'm like, I don't create a bunch of videos all the time, but I stream a lot. So just having that VOD be there automatically, right? I don't have to go into Twitch and download the VOD and then move it over here and then re-upload it. Like yeah. it was just there. So I, I think there's benefits from both platforms. And I think that if you're considering it, if you're already streaming, I mean, it's worth looking into, you know, yeah. at a minimum, it gives you more exposure, even if it is to a couple people or whatever. Just, and it's just, content. Just know this. So. If you're going to stream on both platforms and you want to continue to stream at 1080p on both platforms, be ready to pay. Yeah. I will tell you that yeah. confidently. There, okay. There, there's a way of doing it without paying, but it's, it's hard on your system, so yeah. make sure you have a good system. And there's a lot of yes. setup with an OBS to do. But I know, I know I what you're referring you. to. But you need yeah, a I would a ridiculous. <laughs> you need to spend that much in your PC, yeah, just to do that. No. I I so, I'd rather do it. But I would agree with you. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather. There's third I use parties Restream. Out there that can help yeah, you out. I use Restream. Yeah. It, there's a bunch. Exactly. There's a bunch of different services that do it. Streamyard, I know, is one that does it too. But yeah. like, Restream is for me the easiest 
way to go. And it integrates right into OBS, but that's getting too techy yeah. for a lot of our listeners. So yeah, yeah. Um, with that said, good sir, yeah. I think we've hit all the major topics of this week. And I know you've got an article coming on out. So for those who are yeah. listening on release day, keep an eye out for that on ccghub.gg, taking a look into the tournaments over the last two weeks. And mm -hmm. what else is coming your way, good sir? Oh, man. Outside of that, man, we've got a lot of just random streams coming up. I've got a tournament going on next month. So on the 25th of November, we've got the big uh, Pro Series number two coming out. And uh, that's going to be a $2,500 prize pool to the top four. So again, uh, what they're trying to do there for this Pro Series is make it worth your while to play Maybe make a living off of it every month if you can continue to win, because uh, that's over a thousand dollars to first place. Uh, so that's no joke when you're getting those yeah. payouts. So that's coming up on the 25th. If you guys are interested, make sure you keep a, a lookout. I think sign up should be going out next week, I believe. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm doing a lot of tournaments in the background, a little less snap streaming just because we're doing a lot more around that. Uh, and then if uh, this is more of a shout out of non-snap stuff, but if you're interested in Lorcana and other TCGs and things like that, I am going to be starting some Lorcana content pretty soon. So keep your eyes out for that as well. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully I'll have an announcement on the next podcast on where you know where you can find all that and all mm -hmm. the timing on it. But uh, that's that's kind of been eating up some of my time now. It's a, a fun nice. game and it goes back to the Disney roots. So lo yeah. love the Disney stuff and yeah, it's fun. Nice, nice to see you heading back into the Disney side too. And for me on yeah. the other end, I'm back into creating consistency in my life and it's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I'm looking to yeah, do yeah. at minimum a new card video every week. Plus nice. we do this video and now I'm producing the Tucker Takes videos over on yep. CCG Hub every week as well. Uh, YouTube shorts are starting to come back into my life again, as well as at least three regular streams a week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So nice, nice. I am back into that routine, plus doing everything under the sun on top of it for <laughs> ccghub.gg. So it, yeah. I, I'm, I'm finding that rhythm again. So it makes it, a, yeah. it makes me feel a little bit better knowing that I've got my content pushing out even more so. And mm. it's been, it felt really good this week, this cycle how I ran, you know, and scheduled my time and my week and do this and edit this and bring this up and do this and then film this. And, you know, yeah. plus I still had, you know, three out of five nights not in the office. You know, I was, you know, with <laughs> my kids and my wife and, you know, went yeah. to bed at a normal hour. And, you know, this, this new schedule I've created for myself feels really, really good. And I know I can give better content for you, the viewers and listeners, yeah. when I can do that. So I appreciate you, Default Dan, once again, for joining us here on the Snap Back Podcast, where you snap and we snap back. Default Dan, please say goodbye to all the lovely people. Y'all take it easy. Oh, that was classic. One, yeah, you went classic. classic. Thank you. That felt good. <laughs> this 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 yeah. recording felt good today. It felt smooth. Yeah. Like yeah, I, almost I like think... we've gotten finally into a rhythm three seasons later. You know, almost. I but, know. I know. You know, yeah, it's, it's not like we've worked for years together or anything. 